Um, so just how just is Aeschylus's justice? There is a common view of Aeschylus's Oresteia and of the Eumenides, its third play in particular, which sees this trilogy as a, an expression and celebration of the transformation of muthos into logos. In particular, here that evolution, which so many people have so often associated with Greek culture, is seen as the celebration of an important step in the moral development of mankind, the evolution from vengeance to justice. What is to be done when people commit terrible crimes as they tend to do? We might expect the gods to punish such malfeasance, either by ruining them in this world or by inflicting terrible torments upon them in their afterlives or by destroying their descendants. But experience teaches that all too often people just get away with it. And who wants to wait for the uncertainties of the afterlife or of distant generations to come? So it is easy to understand that people, people seek some form of redress, of retribution, of satisfaction in this life already. The question is, how should they go about it? According to the model that is celebrated in association with the Oresteia, the development from punishment by vengeance to punishment by justice <clears throat> involves a shift from one model to a second one. Vengeance keeps things within the family. Crimes within the family are avenged by other members of the family. Justice expands the horizon to the city. It often involves a prohibition oh. against the members of the family from intervening on their own behalf and requires that the city instead shoulder the responsibility of redress. Vengeance uses a model which we could call specular. You do unto someone else just as that person has done either to you or to someone dear to you. That is to say, vengeance is reactive because it ends up repeating the crime that it seeks to find redress for, it can generate a series of infinite repetitions. I kill your father because your father killed my brother, after which his son kills my brother, and so forth. And it can go on forever. Justice, on the other hand, establishes before the crime, proactively, a list of crimes and penalties with which the terrible events can be, repeat, can be brought to a conclusion without being repeated. That is to say, the reactivity of vengeance leads to infinite repetition, whereas the proactiveness of justice opens the door to closure. Vengeance is always a matter of the individual in ancient Greece, and it's automatic, and it allows no compromise. If you have to avenge a deed, you just have to avenge the deed. And there's no way that you can um, take half measures. Justice, on the other hand, involves procedures and institutions. It thereby moves beyond the individual by defining a category of people who are associated with a category of deeds. And these are associated with a category of legal actions, and these are associated with a category of punishments. Moreover, the procedures of the city's justice require that it be outsiders who are involved, not the insiders of the family. These outsiders represent the city as a whole. Finally, justice admits of compromises. People can um, have more or less of a punishment, they can have a greater or smaller fine and so forth. This movement from vengeance to justice, from mutos to logos, is taken often as a triumph of the political over the familial, 
of the city over the family, of society over biology, and of reason or logos over myth. Aeschylus in his Oresteia was celebrating the Areopagus court, which had recently been reformed by transposing this recently altered political institution into the distant mythic past. Originally, the Areopagus had extremely broad powers in all kinds of domains, but in 462 BCE, those powers were limited drastically by Ephialtes, so that henceforth the Areopagus could only try murder cases. This reform by Ephialtes was profoundly controversial, and Ephialtes himself was assassinated one year later in 461 BCE. Aeschylus's play is only three years later, in 458 BCE, and it tells us how the Areopagus was established by Athena herself to try Orestes for murder. All of the prehistory of the Areopagus is thereby suppressed and obscured. What was the result of Ephialtes' controversial and life-threatening um, reform is presented as what was there from the beginning of the Areopagus. Aeschylus's celebration of the institution of the Areopagus is connected with a shift in scene within the play that begins in Delphi and halfway through moves to Athens. This is something that happens very, very rarely in Greek tragedy. It is an innovation almost certainly on the part of Aeschylus here. Aeschylus's point is that the problem created by Orestes' matricide cannot be resolved by the traditional means of Greek religiosity, in particular by the Pan-Hellenic Greek Apolline religion, which is centered in Delphi. Instead, it can only be resolved astonishingly by Athens, by local Athenian legal institutions. Why the Argive murderer and the Delphic god should decide that, that Athens of all places is the only city that can solve their problems is presupposed, but is never explained. This celebration of Athens must have been approved by the Athenian audience in 458 BC, because we know that the Oresteia won the first prize. So that's, those are the facts. But we can ask ourselves, reading the play, just how just is Aeschylus's justice? I'm going to point out to you five problems in the play. Some of them have been addressed already. Um, Kerry, in his wonderful talk yesterday evening, mentioned one of them. Um, there are others, but these seem to me to be the five most interesting, most intriguing ones. The first question, the first problem that arises is the legitimacy of Athena as an arbitrator. Apollo announces in line 224 that Pallas Athena is going to make the decision. That comes out of nowhere. It's the end of a speech. Nobody reacts to it. But when Athena starts to talk with the... Hello? Is that Athena? When Athena begins um, to discuss the situation with the Irinias, she asks them if it's all right if she decides the case. On the bottom on the right, Athena, I say wrong must not win merely by oaths. The chorus leader, examine him then yourself, decide it and be fair. Athena, you would turn over authority in this case to me, chorus leader, by all means, we respect your merits and whence they are derived. So Athena asks the Arrhenes whether it's all right with them for her to make the decision. Um, 
the crucial line 435, by all means, we respect your merits and once they are derived, happens to be um, textually corrupt. Um, the Greek doesn't scan and it's not clear exactly what the right meaning is and what we should put there. This is a guess, unfortunately, because it's a crucial line for understanding the play. Why on earth do the Arrhenius accept Athena as arbitrator? After all, she is the half sister of Apollo. She shares the same father, though not the same mother. Um, why should the Arrhenius accept her? They don't say why but they do. Next problem. Athena decides that this is much too complicated and difficult a case for her to deal with it just on her own. So she selects members of the city of Athens, the most authoritative and prestigious in order to make a jury out of them. How, exactly how this jury is composed and what the procedure in the voting is, is not entirely clear. There have been many controversies about this. I presume that there are 11 human jurors and that after line 721, one by one, the 11 jurors rise up, walk forward, place their boat in the urn and then walk back. You will see that this edition says that. Um, one reason for that is that it's an excellent edition. And another reason for that is that I did the edition myself. So that's part of why it's excellent. At any rate, don't assume that because the edition and I agree with one another, therefore um, it must be right. You'll see that after line 711, there are two lines for chorus leader, Apollo, 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 chorus leader, that makes 11. And my presumption is that during each of these two lines, in the first line, the juror goes forward. In the second line, he comes back. At the end of that, we have um, Athena who speaks and then says that she is going to give her judgment. Now, how do these 11 ma human male jurors vote? It seems to me the only possible interpretation of the play that they vote by majority, six to five, in favor of convicting Orestes, of condemning him. Even though the exact staging and interpretation of this passage are not quite certain, this seems to me to be the most reasonable view. So what that means is that the human jurors want to condemn Orestes. In terms of human justice, Orestes is guilty and would have to bear the penalty that the Arrhenes want to inflict upon him. Third point, Orestes is acquitted only because Athena votes for him. And as she says in 734, this it is my task to render final judgment here this is a ballot for Orestes I shall cast. Her vote for acquittal results in a tie. Six votes for acquittal, five mortal, one divine, and six for condemnation, all mortal. Why should equal votes lead to acquittal? Athena mentions that casually at the end of this speech, line 741, and even if the votes are equal, Orestes is the winner. That's all it says, and that is enough to secure his acquittal. Fourth point, why does Athena vote in Orestes's favor? Does she do so out of considerations of justice? No. Does she do so out of considerations of equity? No. She does so only because of her own personal history and individual predilections. What she says is, 735 and following, this is a ballot for Orestes I shall cast. There is no mother anywhere who gave me birth, and but for marriage, I am always for the male, with all my heart and strongly on my father's side. 
So in a case where the wife has killed her husband, Lord of the house, I shall not value her death more highly than his. In other words, Athena only has a father and no mother, and so she naturally favors the father. Well, when Apollo had given his speech in favor of acquitting Orestes, he had claimed absurdly that the father is the only parent of the child and the mother is simply a receptacle. Look at 656. Watch, the mother is no parent of that which is called her child, but only nurse of the new planted seed that grows. The parent is he who mounts. A stranger she preserves a, seed, a stranger's seed if no God interfere. Now, this is a claim that any farmer would have known was completely wrong. How can Apollo possibly suggest it? He has proof. He cites the proof in the following line. I will show you proof of what I've explained. There can be a father without any mother. There she stands, the living witness, daughter of Olympian Zeus, she who was never fostered in the dark of the womb, yet such a child as no goddess could bring to birth, Pallas Athena. In other words, the only proof that Apollo has for his absurd claim is that Athena was born that way. Athena happens to be the arbitrator of this trial, and at the same time, the expert witness in support of the defense. As for Apollo's claim that only a father is necessary for birth, and that Athena is the only proof for that, every Athenian knew that goddesses too could give birth to children without having a father. For example, Hera gave birth to Hephaestus. According to Hesiod, Hera gave birth to Hephaestus without a male, precisely because she was angry at Zeus having given birth to Athena. Hephaestus, next to Athena, was one of the most important divinities in the craftsman city of Athena. No Greek member of that audience could have forgotten that goddesses too can give birth without a father. Fifth, and finally, why on earth do the Arrhenians accept this verdict, which is created out of sophistries and injustice, and which goes against their interests and traditional identity? It has been very often pointed out, and is absolutely true, that Athena offers them a cult. It is, to be sure, underground, but better a cult underground than none at all. And being underground, they can participate in the reproductive fertility of the city of Athens and the area of Attica. As Athena says in line 830, um, 829 and the following on the left, be reasonable. And do not from a reckless mouth cast on the land spells that will ruin everything which might bear fruit. No, put to sleep the bitter strength in the black wave and live with me and share my pride of worship. Here is a big land and from it you shall win first fruits and offerings for children and the marriage rite for always. Then you will say my argument was good. So on the one hand, Athena bribes them by giving them a cult. That's perfectly true. But it is often forgotten that she has not only a carrot, but a stick. And, a, and together with this bribery comes an extremely ominous threat. Look at the preceding lines, 826 to following. I have Zeus behind me. Do we need to speak of that? I am the only God who knows the keys to where his thunderbolts are locked. We do not need such, do we? Be reasonable. So it is the combination of deadly threat and religious bribery that persuades the Arrhenes to become humanities, to make the best of a bad thing, and to accept the verdict. So I think that we can conclude that in the humanities, we do see justice of a sort but it is a very rough kind of justice, at least 
in our own very enlightened terms. How are we to explain this? I think that there are, in general, two ways of dealing with this problem and with this kind of problem. The first is historicist. We can say, ah, but those were ancient times. And this was the very best that poor Aeschylus and his fellow Athenians could do. They were not bothered by these problems. They didn't even see these problems because in their dim times, this justice was good enough for them, even if to us in our brighter days, it seems rather defective. Or we can choose a classicist way of approaching it. We can say, ah, Aeschylus was presenting this rough justice not as ideal, but as problematic. And his intention was not to encourage the Athenians to applaud their institutions and his representation of them uncritically, but to reflect on his limitations and to try to improve it. Aeschylus was not only of his times, but dimly at the horizon, he could see us. And he was trying to push his poor fellow citizens in that direction. Aeschylus won the first prize with his play. On the historicist account, the reason is that he flattered the Athenians by suggesting that their justice was already perfect. On the classicist account, he flattered the Athenians by suggesting that they were capable of making their justice even better than it already was. Which model is the right one, the historicist or the classicist? I think there is no single right one. It is precisely the tension between these two models that makes a classical tradition a classical tradition. We might say that Aeschylus is both of his time and of ours, and that we can see that because we are both of our time and of his. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, uh, Glenn. So everybody, please turn on your cameras. So uh, any questions, please raise your hand. Susan, your microphone, Susan, you're muted. Susan, your question is... Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, Glenn, thank you very much. You've um, sort of summarized, I think, all of our dilemmas, at least I know from speaking to um, Rainey and Wendy that uh, we have the same set of problems and Carrie suggested the same. So, so I have two questions for you. One is um, given frankly that the injustice of, of the humanities is really staring us in the face, what accounts for the fact that um, the traditional reading has held on for so long? I'm not sure that you're, I, I like your idea of the tension between the historicist and the classicist readings of it, but I, I wonder if that tension answers the question of why so many generations of scholars, readers, uh, watchers have read it differently. Okay, as if it were the move from, you know, archaic notions of blood vengeance to an imperfect but genuine justice system. That's my first question. And my second question is the one that I asked Carrie yesterday, and I'm wondering if you um, uh, have any thoughts about it, at least for a non-classicist and a layperson who reads all this in translation. And when I say all this, of course, it's not the range of Greek literature that you read, but it's some, you know. Um, why is this story so central? Um, why does it keep running through Homer and uh, Aeschylus and Euripides and, and thereafter? It is um, it's just very striking that they seem to need to keep coming back to it. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, both difficult questions. I will try to speak to both of them briefly. Um, for the first one, I think there's a couple of factors. One is that um, Aeschylus benefited from the prestige, the unquestioned prestige of the ancients, 
in such a way that people were willing to give him the doubt, the benefit of the doubt, or saw even a small step forward as being of mon monumental significance. I also think that the questions that we bring to the table now are more urgent and more complicated because of the development of um, views in the course of the 20th century about women, minorities, um, patriarchal structures, and so forth. So that certain things that bother us would not have bothered people before. Certain things that bother us a lot now would have bothered other people less. I do think that um, there is something to be said for the notion of a certain development in the Oristaya, and that it's not, um, I don't want to throw out the bloody baby in, with the bloody bathwater, um, but, but I think that it is inevitable that our view, and I say our, I mean all of us, our view of such texts has become more complicated, um, more nuanced than it, than it would have been a century ago. That's the first question. The second question is that part of the reason, I think, that the story of Orestes becomes so popular in Greek tragedy, um, it is one of the stories, although not the only one, that is treated by all three tragedians, is precisely that it was um, used in the Odyssey as a foil for the story of um, the house of, of Odysseus. Odysseus is an Agamemnon who comes back and, and survives. Penelope is a Clytemnestra who doesn't betray her husband. And, um, but, and Telemachus is being urged from the beginning to be like Orestes, who grew up and, and showed himself to be a man. Um, so that to a certain extent, the whole Odyssey is constructed upon the foil of the um, Oristaya. Of, of the story of Orestes. But that in itself would not have been enough to give the tragedians um, such an appetite um, for the story, if it were not that the story represents conflict of moral views that is really irreconcilable and that is fascinating. Um, already um, before any of the tragedies that we have, Pindar wrote a poem um, in which he said, why on earth did Clytemnestra kill her husband? And he lists a whole bunch of possible reasons, and all of them are there. Some of them are, seem sorry, quite reasonable to us. For example, he killed her daughter. Some of them seem less reasonable to us. For example, she was sleeping with his cousin. Um, and there, and um, the tragedians didn't like stories that had an easy moral solution because they're, they're not dramatic, they're not interesting. Um, what they wanted to do was to make people discuss and disagree with one another. And this was a story that allowed that um, very, very well. So I think that, that um, it is one of the um, interesting things about Greek mythology that so many Greek myths um, show people doing terrible things for good reasons, or at least for complicated reasons, and thereby raise questions about the nature of human action, human morality, which were perfect for the tragedians. And this is one of them. Does that answer your question? So <clears throat> next question, Amya. Amya. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Glenn. That was um, totally fascinating. And I wanted to ask you about, um, well, I suppose sort of two distinctions that were in play um, in your talk. So the first is, this is a kind of methodological question. I mean, it's the distinction between um, the historicist and the classicist approach. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how committed you really are to that distinction, because it would seem to me a very flat-footed sort of historicism that was committed to the thought that um, 
you know, we should just read all of these texts as, in some sense, merely a product of its time, such that it couldn't be doing anything interesting that's not like just on the page, right? I mean, certainly that's not a kind of Skinnerian kind of historicism. So I was wondering if you were just using that as a, um, you know, a bit of a toy model, or you really think there is a kind of deep distinction here between the historicist and classicist approaches. Um, and my second question was, well, so given the problems you've sort of so beautifully laid out with the kind of traditional way of reading um, Aeschylus on justice, why is it that you kind of have this fundamentally optimistic reading of Aeschylus where you think he's trying to show us that, you know, justice as it is now could, could be even better, it could be more truly just? Or what about an alternative reading on which what Aeschylus is trying to do is sort of show that this very distinction between a kind of archaic, vengeance-driven, um, familial form of justice and a distinct and justice that's civic and based in reason um, is itself a kind of false distinction, right? That things like um, bloodlust and coercion and interpersonal and personal affinities um, and affect lie at the base of any justice system, even one that superficially is supposed to be more kind of civic and rational. I'm just wondering, would you be at all attracted to that kind of more tragic reading of, of the, um, or tragic resolution of the problems you raise? Amir, thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, again, I shall try to be brief. Um, for the first one, nobody should ever underestimate how flat-footed classicists can be. Um, the notion that the meaning of a text is entirely exhausted by the circumstances of its creation and first reception is very widespread in my field. It is one of the triumphs of the 19th century to have, have tried to have, bring, to have brought it to um, fulfillment. Um, it's impossible to maintain completely for all kinds of reasons, if only because the manuscripts we have are hundreds of, if not thousands of years later and are full of um, corrections and corruptions and so forth. But it is an ideal to which my um, profession um, long subscribed. I was proposing it not as something that I would do because I think that to try to do it is first of all impossible and to try to do it too much kills the profession. But it does seem to me to be um, a hermeneutic model which is followed by lots of people who um, may not read Ranke, but who believe in wie es eigentlich war. Um, and um, therefore, I did mean it as a serious alternative, um, flat-footed though it is. Um, and I'm glad that you felt that it was flat-footed. I wanted my tone of voice to suggest that. As for the second one, um, it is um, convenient for us nowadays to take a René Girard or Michel Foucault approach to these matters and say that all such institutions are really grounded upon violence. Um, and um, I don't at all, not only do I not think that such a reading is impossible, I've seen lots of readings of the Oristia like that. Um, what that doesn't take account of immediately is the emphasis in the play on innovation, on pacification, and on achieved harmony. The Eumenides start as Arrhenes, wearing black, and they end as Eumenides, wearing some bright color. I can't, I don't remember whether it's saffron or purple or whatever, but, 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 what is it, Rainy? Purple. Purple, okay. Um, pur purple, ask a woman. Um, and, um, the, um, and that is a visual change, which is radical. If you think of the end of the Agamemnon, there you have um, two corpses and Clytemnestra standing above them and a gist is just coming on. If you think of the end of the Coifri, you have two corpses and Orestes standing upon them and fleeing in gathering madness as the Arrhenes 
in his view, pursue him. The end of the um, Eumenides gives us a procession with goddesses that, bear, that wear purple rather than black and with the establishment of institutions and cults. If there is bloodshed underlying it, it's not bloodshed at Athens, but bloodshed at Argos. Um, and while I agree that we can emphasize the forces of violence and compulsion that underlie the um, creation of these institutions, and while I pointed out that Athena says, we don't really have to talk about thunderbolts here, do we? Um, nonetheless, the, to emphasize that too much is to go against what I see as the stated um, explicit aim of the play. And then you're stuck with either saying, well, yes, um, Aeschylus didn't see that, um, or he did see it and was trying to suggest it as best he could. So you're back to historicist flat-footed versus classicist again. Okay? Thank you. Rainy Destin. Yes, thanks so much, Glenn. Um, my question is about the way in which, in a sense, Aeschylus encourages the first of your interpretations in its most um, naive progressivist form, which is quite contrary to the iconographic traditions of depicting the Furies, um, he makes them truly dreadful. Um, so they are not depicted, I, you know, I'm no expert on this, but I, I read a big fat habilitation on the iconogra iconography of the Furies. And um, they are usually depicted as normal women wearing short hitons because they are huntresses. They, they have to be able to run like a Artemis. And they have a lot of snakes in their hair or they're holding snakes. They are never depicted, at least in this um, um, exhaustive and exhausting Habilitationsschrift, um, as, as uh, having blood dripping from their eyes, wearing black robes, or in any of the ways, even after Aeschylus, there's a beautiful um, crater in Paris, which shows the ghost of Clytemnestra trying to wake up the drowsy Furies. And the Furies look basically like followers of Artemis um, asleep. So it seems as if that Aeschylus is all, and of course, as you know better than I, he, he's given them um, a somewhat different genealogy, um, not Hesiod's genealogy, but to make them daughters of Nyx. Um, so it seems to me that Aeschylus has gone out of his way to make the Furies truly, and the kind of vengeance they represent, truly repugnant in ways that take some liberty, it seems to me, um, with their, their reputation, let us say, um, in, other, in other stories and in other media. And I, I'm, I'm wondering about that. Thank you, Rainey. Um, a wonderful question. Um, and I'm sorry for my throwaway comment about asking a woman about the color of their dresses. Um, I should have um, thought twice before. I, I think the dresses actually and the color is quite significant. Think of um, the robe in which Clytemnestra traps Agamemnon. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's, um, it's very difficult to be sure um, what exactly the Arrhenes looked like in the Eumenides. Um, well, Aeschylus has taken an enormous amount of trouble to create a series of climactic steps going from the end of the Kuifri to the beginning of the Eumenides um, in order to raise more and more the expectations of the audience for what they will look like. At the end of the Kuifri, um, Orestes sees the Arrhenes pursuing him, but he says to the chorus, I see them, you can't. And I think that that only makes sense if Orestes doesn't see anything that we can see. The arrest, the Carifri at the end of the, um, the Arrhenes at the end of the Carifri are invisible. That's because in the Agamemnon and the Carifri, we're on the level of, of mankind, of the human actors. With the beginning of the humanities, we start to get to the divine level. We see Apollo. We will see Athena. Well, we, if we hear humanities, we expect to see them. However, at the beginning, we don't see them. 
what we see is the Pythia who um, comes, who, who sees them and is so horrified that she's knocked to her knees, crawls out and tries to explain what she has seen. She can't explain it. She can say, they're not like the harpies. They're not like this. I've never seen anything like that. And it's only after that, that finally we get to see what she has seen, namely the Rinis themselves. How terrifying this must have been um, leaves a, an anecdotal and, and um, apocryphal trace in the reception of the play in the absurd report that when um, the, this play was produced, pregnant women miscarried. They didn't give birth, they miscarried in the audience as though there were pregnant women in the audience. That doesn't matter. That is a scholarly invention in antiquity to explain the force of how they looked. They must have looked terribly repulsive. And I don't think that Aeschylus would have limited himself to the canon of the vase painters in order to make them that repulsive. He didn't want the Arrhenes to, to have anything sympathetic about them at all. They were dogs who barked and whimpered. Um, they were, they moved in a disgusting fashion and they looked disgusting. I think that the reason that he emphasizes that is partly in order to win sympathy for Orestes and Apollo and for their side. And also beyond that, to create a total contrast to the end of the play when these monstrous uh, apparitions become domesticated as part of the city's cults and guarantee fertility and reproduction. So I think that he's exaggerating the one side in order to achieve the other. I don't know if that helps. No. So, and then there is a question uh, from the general audience. It's a question by Colin Baumgartner, and it says, how are we to interpret Athena's speech around line 60, 650? She says the citizens will be kept from doing wrong, provided they themselves or do not revise and tamper with the laws. It seems that this flies in the face uh, of the classy sits reading and doesn't allow for much revising of what seems a somewhat unjust trial. Um, that's a very good question. It's in the same speech that Athena says that fear is a good thing in the city, that it makes sure that people will um, adhere to their, um, to their laws. Um, this gets back a little bit to um, the question that Amia, that Amia asked about um, institutions being grounded on violence and on dread. Um, that passage um, in Athena's speech has been much discussed. Um, I will tell you that my own interpretation of it, and not only mine, but some other people, um, is that Athena is suggesting, all right, we've had our reforms. Ephialdes reformed the Areopagus. He paid for it. Let's stop now. Let's say that henceforth, we will stick with our institutions as they are and we will not try to fiddle with them. So that um, it, it makes it look as the, I, there, there's, a, there's a fudge in the basic conception of the play because the Areopagus that Athena founds is the one that Ephialtes produced and not the older one. But if, I think Aeschylus is having Athena say, all right, enough reform is enough. Does that answer the question? Um, well, hopefully there is no uh, response here in the uh, Q and A. Um, so maybe wait a little bit. Are there any other questions? Meanwhile, uh, any other hands raised? So, well, so we, I think uh, we, we should uh, stop here. We have uh, the opportunity to have a little break for some coffee or so. 
Um, thank you very much, Glenn, for this uh, wonderful talk and for the discussion. And uh, we'll see, we continue the uh, conference with the Stephen Holmes talk uh, at uh, three o'clock. Thank you.